Today I'm talking to an author who claims he's held more jobs than any sane person should admit to. Singing in a band, selling shoes, managing a financial institution, throwing newspapers and designing military manuals, to name just a few. He also hosted a syndicated radio show for 10 years, worked in theatre and television production, taught both grade school and college classes and worked in multimedia for a major computer firm. All of this is right off his website. He is co-founder of an interactive television company and is currently writing comic books and film and television scripts as well as novels. Welcome Ted Williams. Nice to see you and nice to be here. You've, you've had this amazing, diverse career. How did it all begin? Well, it, it's, it's slightly misleading because it's basically, I've really primarily been a writer for a long time, but on the way to, to becoming a writer and getting to be a writer, um, I kind of made a choice to, to follow my creative path. And as a result of that, I spent a large number of the, my first years of my working life just doing all kinds of horrible jobs um, because I wasn't interested in going off to university and getting into a, you know, some kind of a writing program or something. I was, I was playing music, um, as mentioned I was doing radio, and uh, what I really wanted to do was make one of these things work. So I was doing most of these awful jobs as a way of holding body and soul together while I was doing the creative stuff. Um, but the writing thing actually came a, a bit later than some of the others. It's surprising in retrospect because I'm, I'm from a book-loving family and I was a reader since very young and um, a very devoted reader since very young. And the main appeal to me of writing in the early stages was that it was something I could do without having to worry about other people's schedules or other people's you know, vicissitudes, <laughs> you know, I mean, the kind of weird idiosyncrasies of dealing with lots of other people in creative collaborations. I love creative collaborations, but it does immediately, uh, you know, make everything much more complex. And, you know, I was working a couple of jobs, you know, waiting tables, working in an answering machine, and I could come home whenever my equivalent of the end of the day was. Sometimes it was four in the morning, sometimes it was middle of the day, and then I could do the writing. So that's what led me into it at first. And then after a while I realized, wow, I should have been doing this all along. This is just about perfect for somebody like me. Great. So you're pretty uh, experienced with, with screen work then? Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say really experienced. It's certainly been uh, something I was interested in for a while. But, you know, it's, it's really interesting uh, on this particular tour, this thing that we're doing, Supernova, um, both in Melbourne here and up in uh, Gold Coast, that I'm spending a lot of time with, with actors and, and film people and they are all kind of going through the same thing that I had to go into and through when I was first in, in the writing business. And what had occurred to me about five or eight years into that business when I started trying to get into film, or got interested in film anyway, was that essentially I would have to, st I couldn't, there was, it was not a horizontal move was not going to be easy to make. Mm -hmm. um, the same thing was true to an extent in comic books as well. I was not going to be able to just go across to my my level of, of competency and you know sort of start there. There was still going to be a massive process of getting to know people. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's kind of startling sometimes in the digital age how you know how kind of uh, paleolithic we still are about about you know how we make connections and what we think of people and how differently we think of them when we meet them. And, you know, so I, I kind of, I realized, you know, I would almost have to give up the job that I've already worked so hard, you know, the career that I've had to create for myself mm -hmm. and start all over again. So although there, you know, some things have, have happened and have been happening, it's, it's definitely something I've kind of said, you know, I have such a great career as it is, you know, I don't really want to start over with another one. Um, if something happens or if I can make something happen without having to start over from scratch, then that will be grand. Uh, but it's, um, you know, it's, it's a huge process to, to get to know people. And, and again, strangely, in the, the age of the internet, it's, um, it's literally about physical proximity often because you just have to keep seeing people mm. and keep being there and being in their face. and. I live in Northern California, not Southern California, and uh, so, you know, for me to be in people's faces means I'd have to be spending half my time in Southern California, and, you know, I've got a family, I've got, you know, a life, and I'm, I'm a little selfish about that, so. 
Yeah, okay. Well, maybe we can come back to the, the topic of the comics and the interactive TV and stuff like that. We must come back to that. Um, but before we, we um, get on to that, maybe talk a bit about the books because that's kind of where your writing career started. What, what books and authors have actually influenced you? That is always a very difficult, difficult question, Nalini, because there's so many. Um, as I mentioned to you, I'm, I'm, you know, I started out as a reader very early. Um, I think, uh, you know, when I was 10 or 11, I read The Lord of the Rings for the first time because I didn't want to, The Hobbit was sort of insultingly short, I felt at that point, so I was going to jump right in at the deep end. You, know? you were precocious. Uh, well, annoying, certainly. I, <laughs> precocious is a polite way of putting it. But, um, so, I mean, obviously Tolkien was an influence, and in a number of ways, which we could come back to if you wanted to, but, um, so, so that was one of the things that led me into, into uh, fantasy, but I read a great deal of, of all kinds of things. Just trying to think of people that are in the field, of, Ray Bradbury was a big influence, uh, Theodore Sturgeon, Ursula Le Guin, Roger Zelazny, um, Harlan Ellison, uh, Philip K. Dick, Fritz Leiber, Michael Moorcock, who I had the great fortune to actually get to know and be, be friends with, and um, you know, just tons and tons, but also a lot of other kinds of writing as well. Um, anybody who's ever read my books and some of my tortured, circuitous language would not be shocked to hear that I'm a Dickens fan, you know, that, um, uh, you know, and, and, and Jane Austen and things like that. And also Hunter S. Thompson. I love Hunter S. Thompson. And, one of the nice things about the new books I'm writing um, is that I, I'm kind of, that's the closest I'm getting to do that kind of crazy, you know, kind of uh, modern approach to things more. And Barbara Tuckman, who's an American historian who was a brilliant writer and was, uh, I think, John F. Kennedy's favorite writer, but who is probably my, my favorite, you know, writer of history. So, you know, once you get me started, I could just sort of keep going and keep going, and every time I say a name, I think of two others I should mention, but I'm all over the shop, and, and, and but science fiction and fantasy was always closest to my heart because of the, the extreme breadth of what was possible, the, the ideas that you could work with, and, and the, the number of different styles it, it encompasses. You specifically mentioned Tolkien being an influence in a number of different ways. What, what different ways? Well, the, the most obvious way was that I was, you know, I was captivated by the, the depth of the world. And anybody who knows my fiction knows that world building is one of my favorite things. I'm very, very big on, on imaginary worlds, imaginary histories. And the great joy for me is that, you know, you really only want about 10 to 20 percent of that stuff to appear on the page. But to, to, to know that it feels genuine, you have to really think it through. And, and I love that. I love the intellectual exercise of trying to literally figure out how a society would develop to, to be the society where I want the story to take place or, or why the, um, you know, the meteorological or other factors of the world would create you know, a, a setting in which this would happen. Mm. So Tolkien really moved me in, in that way, that, that feeling of real depth. But what also in, intrigued me and what ha came out very much in my first long epic fantasy, which was the ones that started with the Dragon Bone Chair, was that I felt Tolkien was not really very well understood by a lot of the people who were imitating him. And when I first started writing, we were in the first great wash of, you know, what I would call pseudo-Tolkienian epic fantasies. The first, you know, for the first time there was beginning to be a serious commercial market for people who had read The Lord of the Rings and a few other things but wanted more. Mm. And so you had some, a lot of very good writers, you know, that came in at that time, um, but there were also a lot of other, to be honest, fairly mediocre writers. But what I felt a lot of them, even some of the good, the good, good ones, you know, in, certain, in terms of they're actually good writers, but what I felt a lot of them missed was that Tolkien's, you know, worldview was was very idiosyncratic. He was a particular person. He was a, a product of his time and his own personal beliefs. And if you read The Lord of the Rings, um, unlike, say, C.S. Lewis, he wasn't proselytizing. But it's very much founded on 
his beliefs uh, and a very strong Catholic strain that runs through it, the idea of the fall, the idea of, you know, the, uh, that, that, that humankind is, is literally fallen, that, that the best times were before, that there was a purity that we have since lost, um, among other things. He was also um, an antiquarian. He was somebody who, he still felt Oxford was ruined by motor cars, you know, and electric lights. That had, you know, as far as he is, was concerned. He was a bit of a curmudgeon that way. And I have nothing against that particular feeling. And in fact, it informs his work and other people's work who, you know, whom I love. But I'm not that person. But yet I saw all these writers of epic fantasy, Tolkien wannabes, who were literally kind of swallowing this stuff whole as though this were holy writ and, and all fantasy worlds had to be this way. And I felt they didn't really understand it. So when I wrote The Dragon Bone Chair, I set out very deliberately to, uh, to have a level of commentary built into the work. Um, and for those who haven't read it, I, I hasten to say, not literal commentary. But I mean, you know, that there's a whole level of this stuff that is kind of about what epic fantasy was becoming which was a form of escapist fiction, which is nothing wrong with that, but based on these tropes that were not being very well considered. I don't happen to be somebody who believes that human beings are fallen. I don't believe that the old days were better than the new days. Um, I think the fact that we no longer have slavery is a testament to that. I think the fact that um, in, in all healthy societies that, that women have an equal role in society is a testament to that. That things are slowly, admittedly, but slowly getting better. Mm. And so, you know, I couldn't just write a book that kind of went, oh, the good old days. And so in that, those, without going into any details, throughout the, the, na the, the formal name of the series is Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn, but throughout that series, there are all these, what I would call, sort of booby traps for those who take these things for granted. And that, in fact, a lot of the things that seem to be standard, and I'm only using Tolkienian because he was being the one being imitated. I don't think, mm. you know, he himself was writing what he wanted and what he cared about. Yeah. But the, the imitators were, you know, were just churning these tropes out, the same Tolkienian tropes. And so in my book, I took several things and they look at first like they are the same tropes, but I'm hoping in a sense that even more than the characters, that the readers will be sucked into, into assuming that that's therefore how things are going to work. And then I do my best to pull the rug out from under them. So there was a whole level of this book that for me was not just about Tolkien, but it was about epic fantasy, it was about fantasy in general, and you know, it was partially a process of where our field was at the time, and maybe, maybe in a sense, this might be arrogant, maybe I was my own worst enemy in the sense that I think I also wrote a good book that had, you know, good characters and, and, and you know, the story itself was good. But, I, you know, I, I, can't, I was expecting to be addressed on this stuff. I was expecting that, you know, we've got a field full of talkative, thoughtful people. You know, and that people are going to come after me and say, well, are, are you saying this is a bad trope? Or, you know, all the kind of things that now we start to get on the Internet. But in the, in the sort of mid-1980s, I, I was kind of shocked. Everybody dealt with it completely at face value. And there's nothing worse than having to run around saying, you know, I'm smarter than you think I am. <laughs> you know, it, it, just, it, it just doesn't doesn't do you any good, you know. Um, but I was, I was surprised. I said, don't people understand that we have a field here that has its own metafictional, you know, tropes that have come up and that I'm trying to talk about them and, you know, but as I said, at the same time, I'm a strong believer that if you want to lecture people, you hire a hall. You know, you mm -hmm. don't, I've never read a dogmatic book that I enjoyed, even by some very good writers. You know, I, I, I just don't like dogma in fiction. That's why it's fiction. We are telling stories. And, you know, when, when the point that you're trying to make overwhelms the story, I think you failed. Mm -hmm. You know, but I was disturbed by that. And I think that may have been one of the things that propelled me into writing some other kinds of things was just that feeling of, like, how much noise do I have to make before people realize that there's a serious, I think there's a serious side to what I'm doing. Do you think that, um, that that store that those conversations are starting to happen more and more at places like Worldcon and FantasyCon and 
Well, and on the internet, and um, which you know I'm completely in favor of. I mean, what it better happen? I mean, we we're science fiction is extremely old, and the material fantasy is based on is as old as humankind, mm -hmm. and. You know, Joseph Campbell has been around for years, and so the idea that there may be, you know, and Jung and all these other people, the idea that these may be basic human ideas are not new. Um, so yeah, they are happening now a lot more, and they were probably happening at the time, but there's another factor involved, and that is, um, and I don't want to make this sound self-pitying um, for, for our genre, but, you know, the, the, for the ghettoization of science fiction and fantasy as seen from the point of view of the sort of, you know, mainstream or literary fiction. But then even within our own field, you know, we are the poor stepchildren. And then we also turn around and we ghettoize other kinds of fiction within our own community. Mm -hmm. And we also point fingers at, you know, the romance fiction. And we say, and that's even, you know, that's terrible stuff. That's so formulaic. Instead of realizing that what's going on is, okay, let's take epic fantasy as an example. Because of Tolkien, epic fantasy went from being a, a sort of a, a, a gentle person's, well, primarily gentle man's, adventure that, you know, something that they would write as kind of a personal crotchet, you know, oh, I like doing this stuff, um, E.R. Edison or Tolkien or William Morris or whatever. But because of the immense success of Tolkien in the uh, 60s primarily, all of a sudden it turned into a commercial market, a literal commercial market. Um, which is really what genre fiction is. It's, it's not so much that it's the tropes of the fiction, but it's the fact that, that there is a demand for that fiction. And when there is a commercial demand, what happens is that the bars go down because we're looking for more books to publish. As a result, you begin to get a lot of stuff that is, whatever the sincerity of the people writing it, is essentially commercial product. It would not be produced solely on its own merits. It's produced, or it would not be consumed solely on its own merits. It's consumed because people want more of that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Now, nothing wrong with that. Absolutely not. It's, you know, it's like ice cream. Um, I do not always want to be tasting exciting, weird, savory ice cream flavors. You know, garlic oyster. I, you know, I want chocolate. Sorry, you know. But the problem is, is that is that everybody assumes then that the mainstream bulk of what's going on is in fact the genre itself. And science fiction had already gone through this where, you know, people like J.G. Ballard who are just plain, you know, who, good writers, period. You know, end of story. You don't have to qualify it by saying, oh, he's a very good science fiction writer. No, Ballard is an excellent writer. Um, and, you know, we in, in fantasy, and especially epic fantasy, you constantly have to look at that because everybody judges it by the sort of the lowest common denominator. But there are people doing wonderful, wonderful work. Um, and actually one of the kind of high points, it's the high point of my career so far in some ways is that somebody like George Martin actually says he wrote Game of Thrones because he read the Dragon Bone Chair books and he was very supportive of it during the time. I mean. Uh, I remember George would come up to me at conventions and go, give me that next damn book. Where is that book, Williams? And, um, oh, hypocrite. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, exactly, yes. These things do come back to sting us all one day. But, but no, I mean, so, you know, he literally said, and has said, I think, in interviews, and he certainly said to me that, you know, he kind of viewed, because he wrote a lot of different kinds of things, and he sort of viewed epic fantasy as being the, the way that people in science fiction think about romance fiction. It was sort of the stuff that was churned out for the masses kind of indiscriminately, and at least George, among other people, realized that, you know, there was more going on in the, the Dragon Bone Chair series. And so, you know, it, when you talk about genre, that's the problem, is, is you know, people can step back and go, well, 90% of it is crap. Mm -hmm. Well, as Theodore Sturgeon once so memorably said um, when talking to a literary fiction snob, uh, Mary McCarthy, mm -hmm. uh, as, as Theodore Sturgeon so famously said when she said, why do you write that, that stuff, Theodore? You're such an intelligent man, and such a fine writer, and 90% of that science fiction is just crap. And he said, Mary, 90% of everything is crap. And it's Sturgeon's law, you know? But the problem is, is that in our field, we get judged by that because our fans are more fanish and our loves are more childlike and, you know, we're very, very happy to put on costumes or, you know, I mean, we're 
that's what we like about our field. You know, we love it. And I am not a snob. I'm right in there. You know, I love that stuff. I love the childlike side of what we do and the sense of wonder and all that. But we get judged by others. And as a result, you know, I've spent a huge part of my career having to kind of feel like, oh, I really wish I could put disclaimers in the front of my book saying, just because you think you know what kind of a book this is, you know, you're not necessarily right. Yeah, so it so almost needs a subtext or an alternative title to get people thinking along the... Right, right. Maybe we could like hand out special literary uh, metacritical, you know, like uh, lenses that people would only, only when you're willing to do that would you see the other titles that are on the book, you know, <laughs> or, or the list of important topics that are herein discussed or something like that. Mm, yes, that would, that would be interesting. Um, on Saturday, you started talking about... Um, Tail Chaser's song. How did you, or why did you actually write Tail Chaser's song? I, I wrote Tail Chaser's song out of sheer shock and horror at living with cats for the first time. For for those who don't know, Tail Chaser's song is my my first was my first book, and um, it was an epic fantasy for cats and with cats. Um, and interestingly enough, the Tolkienian thing came up in that as well. Although, what I was kind of more poking gentle fun in that. So I had this set, there's a setup in, in Tail Chaser's song where the main character, who is the sort of, you know, the young ne'er-do-well cat from, from the country, who has come into contact with the big and important cats, so, you know, of great lineage and all that. And it's, it's an intentional, again, you know, nobody would notice it if they didn't look for it particularly, but it's kind of a parody of when um, Frodo and the Hobbits reach Lothlorien for the first time in The Lord of the Rings. And of course the, the, the fabulousness of meeting Galadriel, who is, you know, one of the great figures of the world. And so in my book, they're being taken to meet the Queen of Cats, and it's sort of all built up that they're in this amazing legendary place for the first time, and and when they get to the Queen of Cats, who's a, a white cat named Queen Mir Mirsor Sunback, if I remember correctly, it's been a long time. Um, she's sitting in a shaft of light in this sort of amazing woodland glade, um, but she's got her leg up in the air and she's biting her butt. You know, I mean, <laughs> she's a cat, for God's sake. And it was very intentional on my part, but not as an anti-Tolkien thing, but more as a way of like, I read and loved these books too, and mm. I think you'll enjoy it. So there's, and, and people do now come up to me and say, you know, there's a lot of little Tolkien bits in, in, in Tell Chaser song, aren't there? And I say, yeah, there, there are uh, some intentionally and some probably unintentionally because it was so influential. But I, I moved in with my, uh, my first wife and she had cats. Mm. And I had never had cats before and I was kind of stunned by the whole cat thing. You know, it was um, like, like walking into a palace and um, seeing, you know, some, some con man busker kind of a guy sitting on the throne, you know, it's like, how did they get into this position? They give nothing, <laughs> you know, they do nothing. I mean, I've lived with dogs and dogs basically are your slaves and worshipers for life and your best buddies and they never want to be away from you and they want to do everything you do and they look at you with rapt adoration and cats look at you like, yeah, yeah, I've seen you before. You know, I mean, even after 20 years, right? You know, they're still like, I'm sure I'll place you in a minute, but could you hurry up with the can opener, you know? And I just couldn't quite grasp this, so I started making up uh, folklore and mythology and kind of carted that around in my head for a while. And then when I decided to try to write a book for the first time, um, Cat seemed like a good subject for me since I'd already been playing with this idea. And I liked fantasy, and I didn't know of any fantasies about cats. I knew Watership Down had not been too many years out at that mm -hmm. point, and, and that was a lovely book. And I said, you know, I can do something that's much more of the genre. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I would like to do something that's really like an epic fantasy, you know, that has all those tropes of fantasy that has mm -hmm. magic and prophecies and all that kind of stuff, but I'll do it with cats. And, and that's what I did, and then I was fortunate, fortunate enough to sell it. And um, at that point I realized, you know, I don't really ever want to go back and sell insurance again. So I, you know, or fold burritos or any of the other things I've done, so I'd better take this ring, grab it, and run with it. Mm. Uh, you said after Tail Chaser, you started writing a story set in ancient Egypt, uh, but then you changed 
paths or change tracks. So how did that happen? Oh, well, that was very straightforward. Um, after I wrote Tail Chaser's song, which fortunately did nicely and, and was a good introduction for me into the field, um, and it's, you know, bless, bless that little cat, is still in print all over the world. There's an animated movie being made now of Tail Chaser. And, um, but after I'd written that, um, because at that time I didn't know if I'd ever sell it or not, I went on to work on another project that was a, a pet interest of mine, which is 18th Dynasty Egypt, mm -hmm. which, uh, for those who don't know, is one of the craziest periods of Egyptian history. It's, you know, Akhenaten, the heretic pharaoh, and Tutankhamun, and Nefertiti, and, you know, this crazy, crazy thing where Akhenaten literally took the entire religious structure and pushed it away, 2,000 years of tradition, you know, and, and started his own religion and built his own capital city and all these things. And then, and, and oh, and effaced many of the monuments of his father and the people who come before him, so that our knowledge of them is more sketchy than it would have been. But then he only lasted, I think, what, 17 years altogether, maybe less. And um, then as far as we know, he, he died. It's still kind of a mystery as to how. And within a few years, uh, his, his heir, Tutank Aten, had his name changed back to Tutank Amun, who was the, Amun was the, God who'd been in, you know, the kind of the top of the pantheon, the Zeus of the Egyptian um, pantheon at that time. And the capital was taken back to Thebes, and the, the, the new capital of Akhetaten just sort of turned to dust out in the desert. And um, all of the mentions of his reign were effaced. He became, you know, the, the one that nobody wanted to talk about. So some of these things have actually begun to clear up a little bit in the last few years because of DNA um, typing and things like that, and they're beginning to now identify some of the unknown mummies, and we still don't have a very clear picture of what happened in the 18th dynasty, but we're beginning to get a, you know, a little information now. But when I started writing this in the 80s, I mean, it, you, there have been some books about it, and they're all wildly different because it's always been this, this uh, you know, you can, you can put your own perceptions onto it. It's something that the, the, the observer uh, affects what it is because there's so, such a scant amount of real information. So I thought, you know, what a great thing to, to write a book about. And I, it wasn't even going to be fantasy. It was going to be a straightforward historical. I was going to do it sort of a bit like um, uh, Name of the Rose, Umberto Eco's mm. Name of the Rose. I was going to make a sort of a mystery out of it. Um, and I started that. Unfortunately, I didn't get too far in. And I've used the research for other things, so it worked out all right. But my then and still publishers, Daw Books, uh, who had bought Tail Chaser's song, said, you know, what are you working on? And I told them, and they reacted with horror, because they are, well, no, they reacted with fantasy and science fiction, because that's what they publish. But, you know, they, they kind of went like, ah, oh, we're offering you money to write another fantasy novel. And, uh, you know, that we don't publish historical fiction. They said, do you have any ideas for anything else? And I said, well, I'd like to write a really big fantasy and deal with some of my very complicated feelings about Tolkien and what's been done to his legacy. And, but it also would be my chance to do a big world-building fantasy thing. And they went, yeah, see, that we can publish. And so that was The Dragonbone Chair and Stone of Farewell and To Green Angel Tower, that, that trilogy. Mm -hmm. um, and since then, although I do different kinds of things within the field, I've never really written anything very long that isn't primarily fantasy, science fiction, horror. Mm. Have you ever thought about going back to, to the, the Egypt uh, world and doing a fantasy in that world? I have, and what I also did is, for instance, in my other land books, which are you know near future and they take place largely in, in a series of virtual worlds, um, I actually made a, a, an Egyptian mythology world, which was great fun, and I used some of that information in that. I'd still like to write one, but now what I'd like to do with it, and this is my dream, and if anybody who hears this interview has several million dollars burning a hole in their pocket, I would like to do um, a mini-series. I think one of the, the like, like uh, Rome, I don't know if you guys mm -hmm. saw that here, I mean, which I loved. Um, you know, it, I think it would make a great miniseries subject because it's got all that kind of royal intrigue and scanty costumes and, you know, all the things you have to have to succeed. But it's also fascinating stuff, you know. It was just, a, you know, an entire society made a right turn and then less than 20 years later turned back the other direction and went, we never did that. <laughs> we weren't there. That was somebody else. So, yeah, I'd love to do that. Okay, well, you've just put me in the hot seat without realizing it. 
I interviewed Bruce Boxleitner and he was talking about Lantern City. Then I was inundated with emails asking, where's the Kickstarter? How can we support this? If people want to support it, what do they do? Well, they, they should, you know, uh, email me, Facebook me, um, we'll get something started. I mean, maybe I should do a, fa a Kickstarter for it. Um, I'm, it's interesting because on this particular, uh, it's not really a, it's not a tour, it's not a, a single venue. We're doing Supernova here and up in Gold Coast. I'm hanging out with a lot of actors, including some of the people who are in things like Game of Thrones and The Hobbit and stuff. And um, I, I, I'm kind of constantly kind of looking around for leads into maybe coming across people who are looking for something like that, a big project to work on. And I, I would love to do it. I think it could be wonderful. And unlike, you know, ancient Rome, which has been done a number of times, I can't think of anybody ever doing anything about, in any serious way, about ancient Egypt in the last 30 or 40 years. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like back to the sort of, the, the heydays of the big heyday of the big Hollywood movies is kind of the last time I remember anything in you know like the Ten Commandments and things like that and that was very Hollywood and I think we could do something much more appropriate for our era. Mm, that'd be awesome. I'm sure there'd be a lot of uh, a lot of support for that. I'd love to do something like that. Um, can you tell us a bit more about memory, sorrow, and thorn? Uh, just just to lead in, I've got some fan questions for you. Oh, I'd be happy to. Well, that yeah, that's the series that you know, that was my first big multi-volume thing, and, mm. and in a lot of ways, it's it's kind of defined my career because that's the thing that most people knew me for for a long time, and so anytime I do something different, everybody was always kind of shocked. <laughs> but I point out to them, it's like, no, for for the first two years of my career, I was that cat book guy, so, you know, I mean, and then I was that dragon bone chair guy, and in Europe, I'm that other land guy, because other land is, is, is probably my best known thing there. Mm -hmm. Now, certainly in the German-speaking countries where it's been huge, so um, I, I seem to go from, from one kind of typecasting to another. But yeah, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Mm. Simon De Dewa asked, do you feel you matured Simon enough as a character in Memory, Sorrow and Thorn by the end of the series? Or did he start by saying, why me? And end by saying, why me? <laughs> no, I, I think he, he goes through quite a journey. And one of the nice things about writing very long books um, in which those certainly were, is that you do have the time, you don't have to shorthand things. You can actually show people the experiences. And not only did he have a huge number of what we contemporary folk would call growth experiences, um, he, he literally spends a good portion of the last book being tortured. I mean, you know, there, he, he gets into a situation without giving it any details away for people who might still read it. Uh, a horrendous situation where he is literally um, trapped and imprisoned and tormented for a long stretch. And uh, coincidentally that happened to be while I was going through my divorce and moving countries and was at my absolute lowest ebb as a human being. And it was, but no, the strange thing is it was coincidental. Oh, okay, so it didn't come out of that. Uh, no, I had, I had had this in the outline all along. It just happened to be I was writing that when it was happening. And it was actually terrible because if there was ever a time when I wanted to be writing something where the character is having good things happen and exciting things happen, I was, I remember particularly one of the play I was writing that, people who've read the book will know when I say it, Simon on the Wheel. And I was writing the Simon on the Wheel parts and I was, um, I had my, First wife and I had split up. I was getting ready to move to England. I was kind of, I'd given up my friends and some business stuff I was doing and my house and everything. And I was living in this literally flea bitten apartment um, <laughs> that against off of some nice old lady's garage. And, and it was, the place was totally infested with fleas. So I'm sitting there writing, and the, these things are like, literally, I can see them jumping out of the carpet onto my ankles, you know. I mean, fleas by the dozens. And I'm writing this, and my main character is being tortured. And I desperately wanted in anything, you know, just anything nice to be happening. And no, I had to wade through this bit. So, I mean, if that didn't mature my character, I don't know what did. And and so, you know, I, 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 <laughs> I would tell the questioner that, you know, 
um, every reader's experience is different. And if for them it didn't seem like he got seasoned enough, then they're absolutely right. That's their experience of the book. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I'm ever going to do is tell somebody who says, oh, I didn't like this character or this part didn't work for me. No, you're wrong. <laughs> because, you know, once the book leaves my hands, it's an interactive experience. Mm -hmm. But I, I think uh, if I had put Simon through any more growth experiences, I don't think he would have made it to the end of the book, period. <laughs> Wolf Brother 94 asks, will you ever write a series based on the adventures of Joshua and Vorseva's kids who were alluded to in To the Green Angel Tower? Yes, and thereby hangs a kind of an interesting tale, so it's a good question, it's a timely question. Um, when I wrote the series, the original books, um, I put that in, everybody, not everybody, I mean, but I got lots of mail and lots of email over the years where people say, oh, I see what you did there, that was you setting up the sequel. Well, they should realize that considering it's been, what, 20-something years since I wrote those books, obviously I wasn't in a big hurry to get that sequel written. Um, and in fact, no, that's the interesting thing. What, what uh, the, the writer is, what the questioner is referring to is that um, one of the main, two of the main characters near the end of the, uh, the, 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 the story have twin children and there's a prophecy about their birth. You know, it's all very, um, you know, kind of foreboding of what they will go through in this kind of mysterious prophecy. And at the time, I, I literally did not have any idea or any in, in inclination whatsoever to write a sequel. No, what I was trying to do was, see, I have another frustration about the, a lot of epic fantasy. And that is that in many of these things, it seems like everything's been fine for like a thousand years, and then everything goes to hell, and then, you know, it all gets wrapped up nicely because the hero finds the, the, the magical can opener, and, you know, and then everything goes back to kind of pastoral simplicity again. And one thing I was going to say is, no, this is a magical world. We are here for a period of some years with these characters. But this is a magical world. It has monsters. It has, you know, the equivalent of, of elves and, and giants and all these things. Interesting things are not going to stop happening just because this story ended. And that was literally the reason I put that in there was, see, now there's going to be these adventures that we'll never read about. Mm. Now, cut to fairly recently, um, because of the books I'm working on now, which are what I call the Bobby Dollar books, um, they're, they're much shorter and they're much faster to write because they're only a single character viewpoint through the whole thing. Because of that, I've discovered I can write a book in a feral, you know, in a, in, instead of taking me a year and a half or something to write a big, big novel, I can write a book in less than half a year. So what I'm realizing now is, okay, what would be ideal for me is to write like one Bobby Dollar book every year because they're fun and they're fast moving and I think they're good. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, every couple of years maybe I can publish a volume or a standalone of a bigger, more kind of a, one of my fantasy type things or something like that. So that being the case, I've had an idea for years about wanting to write um, a bunch of different things, not necessarily one big epic again, but a lot of stuff about the, the world where the dragon bone share world. And obviously the one most people are interested in is what happens with those two characters that they thought I was you know, automatically set up to write anyway. But as a result of thinking about what could I work on, I actually realized I could work on that. And then as often happens with me, when I start thinking, well, what, what would I do? Um, that's switching on the idea machine. You know, and I've been staying away from the Ostenard idea machine. I haven't switched it on in a long time. But as soon as I did, and literally, this is true, I was just telling my wife, I can't just turn it on, you know, because she was saying, I really think you should, people really want to see those. I'm going, I can't just turn it on, I can't just turn it on. And then that night after she went to bed, I'm lying there, and it's like five story ideas for Ostenard came flooding in, and I went, oh, maybe I can. <laughs> so, um, I think that's, if, if you had asked me 10 or 15 years ago, I would have said, well, I never say never, but I have no plans. Mm -hmm. Now I actually do have plans. I have an idea about those prophesied twins. I actually have an idea for a story about each of them and what happens to them. And I have some other story ideas that will wrap around it. So the chances are very good that there will be more Ostenard stuff probably within the next few years. So watch this space. So watch this space. Okay. Krim Typhon says, I have no, no questions but an observation. 
When you are writing well, your characters are good, your dialogue excellent. Your plotting is well timed, but the power of your writing is more concentrated in one ability than in the others. Narrative description. The Otherland series allowed you to describe new scenes like a kaleidoscope turning. They never grew stale. It was a tour de force that made me want to skip the hero, villain and storyline and just wander through one world to another. And um, my question arising from his commentary is, oh, in, in your panel on Saturday, you contrasted your original perception of your Otherland world with your realisation of what happened in Germany when you yeah, published yeah. the final book. Can you share that with us, please? Oh, uh, yeah, I was, what I was talking about was that I had, you know, people often ask you, especially with some kind of an unusual idea like the Otherland books, you know, where did you get that idea? What made you want to write these? And I had said for years, truthfully, that it had all begun when I was driving home one day and I was listening to our local, what we call public radio, and uh, was listening to the, um, the author of a book called the R A River Runs Through It, which was a very successful, very good American novel about, among other things, um, a, a family growing up in the sort of the wilderness of Montana, you know, and, and, and Montana and landscape is a big part of it. And he was talking about, you know, rivers as metaphors and obviously you know in in all variety i mean the, the, probably the greatest book ever written by an american uh, huckleberry finn is is by mark twain is you know all about the river journey mm -hmm. and heart of darkness and you know it's 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 a wonderful metaphor but me being me and being a kind of a contrary bastard i was going well that's really interesting but what if the river was actually metaphorical not just used as a metaphor how would you have an actual metaphorical river? What would that be? And it became clear to me fairly quickly that it would have to be either something completely magical or, in our modern amazing world, it could be a virtual river. And as soon as I thought virtual river, obviously it has to be in a huge virtual system of some kind and or a virtual world. And then I started to think, well, you know, how about virtual worlds? And the river is the, 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 the thing you use to travel between them. And on the banks would, you know, would be literally, you know, it could be Troy over here, it would be Alice's Wonderland or Oz over here, meaning the Wizard of Oz, or, or completely made up things that people had created for themselves. In other words, literally, the, the, the sky is the limit. It could be anything. You know, and as a writer who's a, a bit of a trivia freak and, a, and, and very kind of broad in my interests anyway, it was like, oh my God, what a great idea. How much fun would that be? And so when I was on the road with the books and traveling and, you know, and uh, answering questions and doing readings and things, and I would always, people ask, you know, where did this come from? And I would tell them, you know, the NPR interview, the, a river runs through it, blah, blah, blah. And it was only as I think after I'd finished the last book or as I was either, you know, the, between the third and the fourth book or something, and I, and I believe I was in Germany, Somebody asked me this question, and I was standing up in front of a room full of people, and I started the, the, the usual answer, and it suddenly just hit me like a bolt of lightning. Whoa, that's not true. That's not really where those books began. They began when you were six years old, or whatever it was, I think, in the Disneyland fairy tale boat ride. And that was the real beginning, because the fairy tale boat ride is this dippy little ride for kids. Um, at Disneyland that I think they still have, but it was definitely there when I went as a child, and you sit in a boat, and Snow is your guide, and they take you down this tiny little river, and there are little miniature castles, and, you know, there's, there's, uh, you know, Mole's Hole, and there's Rabbit's Boat, and there's Toad Hall, and oh, there's, you know, the house where, you know, uh, the, the Duchess from Alice in Wonderland lives, and see, there's the, the Red Queen's Garden, or whatever it is, the Duchess's Garden, I can't remember who has the cards, but, you know, and, and you go along doing this, and I said, oh my God, no, that's what I loved about the River Runs Through It idea, was that it brought up the, you know, because when I was a little kid, I just wanted to get out of the boat, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, I knew I couldn't literally go into those places, but it, that was... I wanted to go into those, but I wanted to just hop out of the boat and get to go be in Alice's Wonderland for a while, or be in the wind in the willows. And 
So it was this embarrassing thing that I'd been telling this very serious story for, for years and years. And no, it was totally about being a six-year-old and going, wow, look, <laughs> you know, it's Sleeping Beauty's castle, hooray. So yeah, so that's that was really the basis of it. And you know, I'm sure that if I look into any of my books very far, I'll find some similarly unimpressive uh, you know, childhood passion of mine that has cropped its way up. Oh well. Let the inner child come out to play. Uh, well, I do. That's that's what I get to. I get to. My inner child <clears throat> is the one who makes me the money that allows me to be an adult with responsibilities. And you know, I, I think that's the luckiest combination that, that you can have. Absolutely. Dagnarus seventy five says uh, he's curious how you feel about uh, how other land has stood the test of time, especially because it's so technology based. Well. That's also another good question, and the interesting thing is, the only thing so far that I would say with other land that hasn't completely stood the test of time is that actually things are happening even faster than I thought they would. But um, I've been, and part of, the, part of what worked for me is I, I'm not a scientist, I'm not an engineer. I am an observer. I'm an observer, I'm a person who pays attention to things. and. One of the things about the, the other land books that was, was really fun was that I, I, I didn't pin things down to a specific time, but there's a kind of a general feeling that at some time, you know, in, in late in this century or in the middle to late part of this century. And um, so in the, you know, the, the, the late 2000s or so, or middle 2000s. And in fact, you know, things are going even faster mm -hmm. than they would have. But I never specified a time. So, you know, you don't have that, it's like 1984, you know, is now both the, the terrifying future and it's like, you know, it, it's back when, you know, David Bowie put out such and such an album, you know, it's like <laughs> when such and such, the Detroit Tigers won the World Series in America, you know, it's, it's a, a specific date in history now. So I was very careful not to put any actual dates in there. But as far as the technology stuff goes, no, I've been incredibly lucky and in fact, a lot of people ha um, kind of send me, you know, to add, it's other land, you know, whenever these new things come up. Mm -hmm. and, and for one thing, I was really worried for um, back in the, the 90s, there was a big push to use the term PDA. I don't know if you remember that. When personal digital assistants mm -hmm. were very big, and I can't even remember now who, the, who, who all made them, but they were, you know, everybody was getting those besides Blackberry, but there were, you know, yeah. uh, other companies. And I had picked PAD as the thing to call mine in, in, in the books, that the, the very small computers that people carried around with them, which was not the height of technology. The height of technology was having your stuff implanted. But you know, these small things were called pads. And I remember thinking at the time, damn it, so close, you know, because I thought PDA was going to become the, the, the acceptable term. Yeah. And then PDA largely died out and pads did actually start to yeah. come out. And I was like, hooray, I've been, <laughs> I've been vindicated. Yep. But it's actually funny, and people send me things all the time where these things that I talked about, again, not as an engineer, not as a scientist, not as somebody trying to predict what the straight line progression of technological change would be, mm -hmm. but as somebody saying, what kinds of things would people want as the technology get better? What mm -hmm. sort of things, and what kind of divisions would there be? Because obviously not everybody has the same level of technology either. You know, poor people or poor countries never have, you know, the same setup as the rich countries or the rich people. So I, I very much try to do it that way. And, uh, you know, a lot of stuff is actually happening, even some of the crazier stuff, including the whole book is built around the premise that very rich and powerful people want to live forever. It's not physically possible, no matter how many organs you buy and all that kind of stuff to keep the bodies working forever. And so they create these virtual universes and they're going to download or upload themselves mm -hmm. into these virtual universes. And I remember a few years ago, somebody sent me an article and it was like, uh, Bill Gates and all these other people are, are funding research into immortality <laughs> and stuff like that. And I went, my God, because one of my characters is even sort of, it's not the real Bill Gates, but he's sort of loosely, he's kind of slightly jokingly based on that kind of, mm. of, of tech entrepreneur guy. Um, and the company that he runs is named after, you mentioned my, um, my, our TV, internet TV, our internet interactive TV, sorry, our interactive TV company that crashed and burned is, is, became the name of the, the bad corporate guy's corporation in Otherland. 
So it's 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 kind of a double joke. So because I was working at Apple at the time, where Steve, where Bill Gates, despite being a perfectly nice guy, was considered to be the Antichrist. So so the Antichrist is his company is the same company that I had that crashed and burned, Telemorphics. So it's all uh, you know it's all been quite gratifying actually, and I still get emails from people regularly saying, "Have you seen this article? Boy, isn't this other land? Oh, you were right about this one. Oh, it's happening even sooner than you thought." But it's kind of a parlor game around our house. I'm sure it is. Um, Mage Two K wants to know how development on the other land game is progressing. I hear it's in closed beta. Well, yeah, there's been a change though for a variety of complicated reasons. Most of them having to do with funding. On you know, back at the the development company in Germany, um, they the the studio in Singapore is no longer going to be used, and they're apparently moving the game to have its very last iteration in either, I think, Canada or the United States. And that actually, this is April, and the last I talked to the, um, the, the head of the corporation there, they, he was saying he thought this stuff would all be wrapped up negotiation-wise within the next month. Now, the game was supposed to be out in January, and this has, has all this financial kerfuffle has delayed that, which is frustrating to me. Mm. But um, I've been going over to see it for years as they've been working on it, and um, you can see some of these, some of it on the net, and, and it you know it looks brilliant, it feels brilliant. The ideas, even where they're diff, they differ from my book, they're very much in line with the spirit of the book, which is fine. I don't you know I, it's like a, a game is like a movie. You don't want to recapitulate a book, mm. and in fact, with a game you can't because you're trying to have the individual be involved, and you don't want them just replaying a story they already know. You want new stories. But um, I'm very pleased with it. I'm still very excited about it. I'm irritated about having to, to wait more months than I thought I would, <laughs> uh, you know. Um, but that's where it is. We hope to know within maybe the next month or two what the, what the reset release date is going to be. Mm -hmm. So what's it been like to see your work developed as a computer game? Well, it's been particularly interesting because one of the reasons that I wrote the the Otherland books, then another reason besides the the thing I just told you about with Disneyland and all that, is when I my last normal job or my last actual job where somebody else paid me for doing something other than writing. Other than writing, <laughs> well, I was actually doing writing, so it was, but it was more like tech writing stuff. Um, was for Apple Computer back in the late eighties, mm. and. Um, I started working there in their technical library, but after a while we got very involved in trying to update the library and began to do a lot of investigation into what at the time was called interactive multimedia. This is sort of age of steam for the virtual age, you know, this was the beginning of it. And so I was going out to all these seminars and conferences and getting to see like the latest, the newest crazy tech that was being come up with which even at the time was quite impressive, some of it. I mean, it was real. It was the first real virtual reality and things like that. So, but my immense frustration, I'm, you know, I'm a writer, I'm a, a person who imagines things. Mm -hmm. And I could already see, you know, what you could do with this stuff once the processing power was fast enough, once the resolution, the visual resolution was good enough. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't there, it was still what I thought possibly decades away. And as a result, um, when I was starting to play with this idea, I just threw all of my interest in this stuff into it and went, you know, well, this will be, you know, this is what I can do. I can't make this stuff. I'm not an engineer, but I can invent it in my head and turn it into a story and make it real for people in that way. Yeah. So I was essentially creating something like this game in the only way I could at the time, which was purely as a product of imagination. Mm. So when I actually went for the first time to the studio in Singapore, and, and saw what they were doing, and they're saying, okay, and this is how you create yourself, and here's your virtual space that you live in, like in the books, and here's this, and here's that, and all that stuff, and I'm going like, I would probably never have written the books if this existed back in the, the late 80s, early 90s, when I started the project, you know, I, because it, it, that's what I wanted really more than anything else, was I wanted to be able to jump into this new world of virtuality and, and play with it. So. You know, I'm I'm not just interested in it as a game and as something that will perhaps economically affect my life. I'm really interested in it as a social experimentation space, which mm -hmm. is kind of my one of the things I'm always most interested in about the internet is mm -hmm. is 
the way communities develop, the way syntaxes develop, the way that people interact with each other, um, the way that sort of rules and myths, and I mean, because if you, you know, I, my kids are teenagers, and you know, the, the, the internet has already developed its own folklore, you know, of mysteries and horrors and magical things that happen that nobody will quite acknowledge, but yes, it's true, and you know, urban legends and stuff. Yeah. Um, and that stuff, that always fascinates me because that's human beings working out who they are and what the outer limits of, you know, of what reality is. So, so yeah, the game to me is a boon because it's what I wanted to do and what I wrote the book instead because it was not technically possible at the time. And let's face it, you get all the toys. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Are there any aspects of the process that have particularly bemused you or fascinated you? Uh, the game making process? Mm -hmm. No, actually, the, the first time, uh, because again, unlike a lot of people outside of this particular field, I've been thinking about it for a long time. And I can do my thought experiments much faster than people who have to actually make it happen can do their work. So I've been through zillions and zillions of scenarios in my head. And no, I'll tell you the thing that most inspired me in the first place was back you know, in 1988 or something, and I was at a conference, and unfortunately I can't remember who it was who was doing the presentation, but it was one of the very first shared virtual realities where you could have two people in it at the same time, mm -hmm. and they would see each other, mm -hmm. and they would, you know, move in relationship to each other, so you had, you know, the, so the computer had to be constantly um, adapting for both Mm -hmm. You know, what was going on with both characters or both people at the same time. I might have seen a documentary on that. Yeah, it was very, Long very early. The, the, <laughs> the, the characters themselves were almost kind of just like, you know, they were just, you know, polygons, mm -hmm. you know, with three-dimensionality. But mm -hmm. they, there wasn't much more to them than that. But the guy who was giving, they, and so the game, that ev what everybody learned, wanted to start doing with it uh, immediately, because it also had you know, some sort of three-dimensional objects that you could get on top of or go behind or stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but the shapes were also not solid either, so there was all these different kinds of weirdnesses about it. But the guy who, was, who had made this particular simulation said, yeah, we've been playing hide-and-go-seek, um, you know, in the office with this now for a few weeks. And he says, and the best we found that when we're playing hide-and-go-seek, for somebody who's playing for the first time, um, if you're playing against them, the absolute best place to hide is in the other guy's head. Right? Because like we, we bring these physical these physical beliefs in what should be possible and you know when you're you know when you're playing hide and go seek, you're always looking out for where somebody else is. And the idea that that you might be permeable enough for the person you're playing against to jump inside of you just doesn't even occur to you, you know, and so, yeah. you, you know, you'll, you can literally keep somebody looking for hours and they can't find you anywhere because you're right there with them, <laughs> riding around in, in their, their head. Um, oh, and well, that could be really, that could, that's kind of a recipe for a horror. It <laughs> is, it is, but it's also a recipe for a completely different way of thinking about mm. things, you know, and it was a, a one sentence lesson to me about, you know, okay, everything's going to be different, it will all have its own rules, we can't just use the same rules, you know, that mm. things will have different meanings then. And that was really, as when I started writing the Otherland books, that I kept very strongly in mind in, in terms of, you know, don't let your mundane 3D tactile world uh, associations rule you mm. because these things will develop their own reality, whatever it might mm. be. And that, that includes things like, you know, syntax and, and who you are and how people think of you and, and not just how they view you, but literally how people think of other people that, you know, will all be kind of Schrodinger. And we're seeing it already, obviously. Yeah. On the Internet, everybody is a Schrodinger's box, mm. you know. You're talking to somebody and their picture is that, you know, gives you an idea of what they supposedly look like or their name does or what they say about themselves but there is no physical way to actually know, you know, and so that all through the Otherland books that everybody realizes that people are only, you know, people are not necessarily what they seem they are and, you know, sex, sexual identities, age identities, all of those things are, they're all completely like, like, Schrodinger's, like Schrodinger's cat, they're just probability issues as to whether the cat's alive or dead, you know. Oh, everybody assumes that dark matter is run by a guy. Really? Yes. Why is that? Because normally, most of the time, it would be. 
think. We had just had a huge thing on, um, a, a, a huge kind of meme, not a meme, but a, a, a kind of a whole series of, of uh, interesting conversations that ran through Facebook because there's, um, there's a really good uh, science uh, website whose whose name has the F word in it, so I don't think I'm supposed to say it. But anyway, I'm just <laughs> well, I, I'm trying and I'm trying to remember now what it is because everybody who I know knows it, and I'm really embarrassed. And it's only because I'm jet lagged that I can't. I think it's called I fucking love science Oh yeah, and it is a brilliant site. Mm -hmm. You know, it's got all kinds of cool news from you know all the neat stuff that's happening. You know, and 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 provocative stuff and all this. It's just really good, good website. And not only is it, it is it run by a woman, but it's run by one woman. You know, mm -hmm. that's the shocking thing to, to most people that I know that who have any sense is not that it's run by a woman. Who, you know, that's nothing to be shocked by. But the fact that one person is doing this amazing website. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's exactly it. I mean, we, we still carry this baggage with us everywhere we go. And so one of the fun things about the uh, the Everland books was trying to figure out like what baggage are we going to have to drop as mm. we live more and more in these unreal realities. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> um, R R S P James asks, is your other land series ever going to be made in, into audio books? That, I'm not certain what the situation is on that. I, I think so. In fact, I, a part of me says, yes, it is, um, that we may have even signed or be, be negotiating contracts on it. Mm -hmm. I don't know for certain though, and what they should do is they should either contact me on Facebook or my wife who's on mm -hmm. Twitter as Mrs. Tad. She's also, you know, lest you think, oh, you know, the little woman. She's She's got a gigantic uh, Twitter feed based on, um, she, she writes uh, in the voice of, of one of our dogs and it's like got uh, hundred thousand plus followers and stuff like that's really funny and she's got other stuff she does on her own but also since she won't let me do Twitter I get to do Facebook she gets to do Twitter so because stuff comes up all the time on Twitter she has a Mrs. Tad you know hashtag or whatever and um, but she's kind of the family expert on all the business stuff and where we are on various audiobooks and stuff so that would be my suggestion and also to, to, to the, the, the woman who runs uh, TadWilliams.com website is brilliant uh, and, and is up on everything as well. She's almost a member of the family. So any of right. those sources would be a good place to go start asking questions. Great. Dolores Anderson asks, how do you keep all the plots flowing and correct time-wise in your series with larger central casts? Uh, you know, I wish there was an answer I could give to that. I am. Uh, of all the writers I know, I honestly don't know any writer who is as much of a black box as I am because I, I have learned, and, and this is the thing about writing, there is no one way to do things. Mm -hmm. And un unfortunately some writers when they're, when they're starting out or people who want to be writers feel like there, there must be some kind of way that you do things that is the most useful or the most productive or whatever. No, every writer is different. and. With stuff like that, you know, it's really honestly almost like trying to say, how does your brain function? I don't write much down, except for the actual books themselves. Mm -hmm. I found that the less that I write things down, the less solid they are, and the more they will sort of float freely and associate with each other. It's sort of like a gigantic cocktail party of mm -hmm. ideas in my head. Yeah. And everybody's mingling and running around, and sometimes people make friends, yeah. or they become a group together, or they fall in love, and you know, and they, mm -hmm. they clump, and that starts to become something. And then I will take that something out and I will compare it to other possible some things that I could use in that place. And then it's like multi-dimensional chess, you know, where you have to try and follow them all as far as you can. Yeah. Because, you know, the further out you get, the, 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 the vaster the spread and the more complex the ramifications. And uh, for me personally, some people like to write all this stuff on charts and, you know. Mm. And for me personally, I've found that the more I write things down, the less fluid they are. Mm. And the more, and I'm just lucky enough, I'm blessed to have a good memory. And so I just kind of cram everything in there and then I have long stretches of just thinking and trying different things. And then some of it I am firmly convinced is going on also at a subconscious level that I can't even access because I know that, and, and a lot of people will tell you, I mean, you. I'm sure you know the famous story about uh, Kakula's discovery of the formation of the benzene molecule, and he actually he, I don't know that one. Well, it, it was a famous famous uh, uh, 
thing that he, this, this particular scientist spent some long time trying to figure out how a benzene molecule, how the different atoms could actually interact in such a way to make a stable molecule that would still do all the things that benzene did. And the story is, is that he had a dream of uh, snakes with their tails in their mouths, Robbers. rolling, yeah. yeah. And he realized it had to be a ring, that that was, that that fulfilled all the, you know, it was a stable structure, but that yet would do all the things that it needed to do, you know. Mm. So I don't literally think that he had a muse or that God was whispering in his ear that the benzene molecule is a ring. Um, I suspect that what was going on was what I have found to be true with me too, is that some answers, you know, you, you, you know them subconsciously before mm. you know them consciously. Yep. You've got to get out of your own way. Yep. This is also why I don't particularly believe in, um, in writer's block either. Mm. I think writer's block is a combination of a necessary pause when you're not ready to do something yet and mm -hmm. it hasn't percolated yeah. su uh, sufficiently, coupled with, in, in the case of a lot of writers, um, uh, self-confidence issues. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you're already somebody who feels like, you know, I don't know if I'm a real writer or I don't know if I really have the, the, the ideas to sustain things and, you know, when you have a lag or a pause or whatever, I mean, even the term block I don't like, you know, then your first thought for those kind of people is like, oh my god, I really am a faker, I'm a poser, I'm, I'm over, I've done everything I can do, I'll never have another idea, you know. Yeah. And I, I'm not, I don't feel that way, for whatever reasons, I don't feel that way, and I recognized early on, maybe because I did other kinds of creative stuff also, mm. that that's just the creative process, especially with complex stuff. Sometimes you just have to give it a little time. You have to walk away. I mean, we all know that with like when you can't remember something. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you just have to stop trying to remember it and it pops up. Yeah. Well, that's, I think, even more true with these big complex issues. Your, your subconscious is processing all the time. You know? And so anyway, so I, I walk away from things when that happens. And, and it seems to work very well. So, uh, you know, all of these things are part of my process, but they're... Like I said, I'm very black box. I don't. I, I. I. can do the conscious stuff. I can tell you. I'm. A, I, I think I'm a good editor. I can say. I can look at your manuscript or your whatever and say, okay, well, this is happening a little too early. I, I don't really feel connected to this character yet, so therefore this doesn't have the impact. You know, I have that analytical side, and I can do that with my own work. But I don't. I do that in editing or in rewrite or in whatever, or with some kinds of problems that are very linear. Mm -hmm. But with the, the big issues of literally what's going to happen next, oftentimes, most of the time, I just sort of you know, let the black box tick and then something will come out. But there's, you know, there's a lot of manipulation, don't get me wrong, it's not just lying there, it's you know, playing games, doing experiments. Yes, yes. Well that leads neatly into unsubscribe from's question which is, how does editing work for you? It might be a dull question, but he'd love to hear an in-depth answer. No, it's not a dull question at all. And in fact, being a good self-editor is one of the, the really most important things about being a writer. Um, because if you are starting out, um, if you're going to attract people's interest in the first place, there's very few editors and publishers, especially these days, who has the time to look at a huge mess with a lot of good ideas in it and say, oh, okay, well, I'll commit the next five years of my life to bringing this, this writer along to a point of being, you know, a publishable, saleable commodity. Um, that used to be more true than it is now. It mm -hmm. probably was never that true, but it, it is definitely less true now mm -hmm. um, because all the margins have gotten skinnied up on, on publishing. So what I do, I, again, I have kind of an, an idiosyncratic process because when I'm writing the really complicated things, mm -hmm. I always found that about 90% of my work was in the first draft. Because I was doing these big complex tapestries with all this stuff woven together, yeah. um, I, I found out very early on that what I really wanted to do was go slowly forward, make sure I felt comfortable with everything, knit it all together, get to the end, and then do a much more kind of a polishing approach to, to the, the rewriting. In other words, yes, fix things, change things, speed things up, slow them down, whatever, but I would almost never take like a whole plot or a character and just pull them out and, and start over again because it, it's literally like taking a, a thread out of a sweater. You know, you just unravel the whole thing and you have to start from scratch. So for me with the big books, most of that editing happens in my head during the first, you know, during the first draft. Mm -hmm. However, what's been interesting to me is 
with the um, the books I'm working on now, the Bobby Dollar books, because they're all told first person. Mm. The entire viewpoint all the way through the books, you the reader only gets what the main character gets. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not telling 15 different stories at the same time. And interestingly enough, I've found that I'm much faster through the first drafts. Not, sim not just because they're simpler, although that's part of it, but because it's much easier to do rewrite. Mm -hmm. So I, I say to myself, I'm not quite sure this is exactly right. You know, this feels like I'm a little premature here with, with, with charging ahead with this. Mm -hmm. But I know with these books, I can go back and fix them more like a standard, like the more like the standard writer's model, where I will go, mm, I don't really like this. Maybe I'll save this character for another book, or you know that that started out good, but then it really flags in the middle. So I'll just write an entirely new scene and stick that in, and that will give that character more weight moving towards the climax of the book or something. I'll make much bigger changes, but no, I mean. First of all, I think that, there, again, there, there are as many models as there are writers. But the editing thing is a big part of it because what you're doing when you're editing, and I think accomplished or long-time writers, we get to where we can start to do this in the first draft, too, as well. Um, but what you're doing in the editing process is you are, for the first time, becoming a reader. Mm -hmm. And you are stepping away from the book, and you are having the experience of, you know, how fast is this moving? Do I feel like I'm getting the information I want to get? Is the character sympathetic? Things that you can't see when you're writing because they feel like you know them and you know you may not be getting it all on the page. So editing is where you begin to become other. When you become something other than the writer, you become a reader, you become uh, an analyst. And so it's vitally important to have those skills. And it's also another reason why you need to stop reading one kind of fiction. You know, if you're a writer, you've got to read nonfiction, you've got to read journalism, you've got to read zillions of different kinds of fiction because you're broadening your editorial mind. You know, you're, you're giving yourself more experience of different ways to do things. You're sharpening your, your perceptions of things. So no, editing is very, very important. And But as I'm finding out now, I, for so long I had this one process and now I'm doing something different, and uh, it's almost more like, it's one of the reasons I used to enjoy writing short stories, because it gave me that thing where I could just dash it off and then yeah. revise at leisure and make it how I wanted it. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm able to do that a little bit with these new books, too. So I, I've realized I'm not just a one kind of rewriter. I'm, I'm, a, I'm whatever the horse is for the course. So. Yeah. Um, I assume that you have uh, an independent editor as well? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, my main, ed well, I'm, a I'm actually very fortunate. I have three um, editors who actually are involved in my work from the beginning, usually, or not from the beginning, but I mean they are my primary editors. Because my American publishers, um, I'm the only person in the, of that publishing company who gets this, but I have both the publishers are my editors. So not just one of them, not just, you know. Uh, there is both in, in the case of Daw, it's Betsy Walheim and Sheila Gilbert, and they're both my editors. And then my wife uh, used to be my British editor. So, you know, she was, was a brilliant editor. And um, so she is also my, my, she actually probably reads it sometimes before they do. Um, and so she's my other first line editor. So I have these three very smart women who are, are you know, doing that stuff for me. And I also, I like having more than one editor that I trust mm -hmm. because I'm very pig-headed, I'm very, um, I'm very do-it-myself-ish, and so if I just have one other person and they say, well, I don't like this bit or this seems too slow, um, you know, I, I, if I don't agree with them, you know, I'll just kind of keep it at arm's distance and go like, well, that's just what you think. But if two or three people tell me the same thing, mm -hmm. and there are these people whose opinions I trust and value, mm -hmm. then obviously I have to pay attention. So. Yes, yes. Um, you've, you've mentioned Bobby Dollar. Uh, Mayor Landsman asks, how did the idea for the Bobby Dollar books come about? It's ballsy to write a backstage pass to the afterlife. Did you just feel like writing urban fantasy, or did you come up with the idea first? I've actually had the idea for a long time. Um, I, I remember doing a, like a seminar back in maybe the early 2000s or the late 1990s 
um, for a bunch of homeschoolers. I was invited out to talk to a homeschooler, or you know, not just talk, but I'm mean, gonna do a series of events at a, a homeschooling convention. Yeah. And uh, I remember at the time I already had this idea in my mind, which was essentially in its most boiled down form then, it was heaven and hell have a thousands and thousands of year old Cold War. And that my character would be the equivalent of one of those like local operatives in, in a spy novel who is, of course he's with one side, but everybody's true allegiance is in, in doubt and you know it's very easy to get in a position where you don't trust your own bosses either because you know the channel between you and the top you don't know how it's being messed with or whatever and uh, so I had that idea way back when and in fact I used it at that particular conference as a kind of a okay let's I'm gonna show you guys how I work up an idea for for a story and you guys you can help me you know we'll talk about it and I'll say well what would happen in this situation you know and here's you know if that's true then who does this and so I remember using it back then, so I've had the idea for quite a long time. And then the, the, the Shadow March series, which was the epic fantasy series that happened but just before this, was uh, another one of my kind of experiments that, that, that uh, went an unexpected direction, which was that I did the first volume as a, an online serial. And you know we had a website just for that and all that stuff. And it turned out to be um, great fun really interesting, really fulfilling, and financially disastrous. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, at that point I had to go ahead and write, the, I, I didn't want to leave the story unfinished. I had spent a year writing this, essentially, a book online, and, you know, I wasn't just going to leave that unfinished. I wanted to know how it finished. The people who, who subscribed wanted to know how it finished. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't afford to do it online anymore because I wasn't. I actually had to write another book that same year, like a, a regular kind of book, to be able to to, to pay the bills, because Shadow Mar I mean, it, you know, this was back in two thousand one. It was very hard to make money off of fiction online. And you're just one of these people that you know you want luxuries like a roof and food. I know, I am. I'm crazy that way. So, um, so then I wound up. I hadn't planned to write another long epic fantasy. I really just wanted to do this as an online project. But once I'd started it and I wanted to finish it, I had to see it through. So then it was several more years doing the Shadow March books. Um, so at that point, I, the last thing I wanted to do was another epic fantasy. I was a little worried that um, because of the way the market's changing, that if I launched off into another big science fiction, which is another idea I had, that I might completely terrify my audience. So I said, well, what would I like to do that I would enjoy doing that would be different than the epic fantasy but that my fantasy readers could still enjoy. Mm -hmm. And so that idea came up and I said, oh, well, yeah, there'll be a lot of world building because I have to invent the whole way that heaven and hell and the afterlife works. And, and it's, you know, in the first book you see a lot of heaven, in the second book you see a lot of hell. And it's got an imaginary city, which is a big kind of noir crime city that happens to be in place of the suburbs in which I grew up. So it's my part of the Bay Area, but I made a city out of it because good noir has to take place in a city. It's an urban fiction. Um, and that's why they call it urban fantasy, I guess. So, you know, it's got all the world building stuff, stuff I love. It has even more of what I like to call my sense of humor. Some people might differ, but you know, it has more of what I think of as the, the real me in it. The character's voice is very much like mine. It's one character narrating, so it moves very quickly. And I went, well, after writing another five or six years worth of epic fantasy, this would be, you know, a, a really nice change for me. But I think it's also something that other people, even case, you know, even some people who don't read this kind of stuff mm. could enjoy. So, so that's what I did. I launched into that, and I am loving it. There's so much fun to write. So I've already written the first. It's published, that's The Dirty Streets of Heaven, and I've written the second, which is going to be called Happy Hour in Hell, and it's finished. And I'm actually, maybe while I'm here in Melbourne, certainly probably while I'm in Australia, I'm going to finish the third, which is called uh, Sleeping Late on Judgment Day. And after that point, I'm going to see if people want me to keep doing them. And as I mentioned earlier, if I can, I'll do those and some other you know, fantasy and science fiction stuff as well. Well, I particularly like Bobby Dollar. I, th I think I'm just getting a bit too many 
epic fantasies to read at the moment, and it's just really nice to have a change of pace. Well, see, that's the way I feel as a writer, too. It's like, you know, I love epic fantasy. I love it. When it's done well, it's beautiful. And I love writing it, and I've had a great time doing it, and I'm sure I will do more epic fantasy. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's just it's just a pleasure to do something different. It's like, and, and what I told somebody the other day who was asking me about it, I, they said, well, you know, what kind of book is it? And I said, well, you know, I gave them the kind of general plot rundown in like a sentence or two. And then I said, basically what it is, is it's an airplane book that will reward a lot more than that if you bother to read it for more than just the sheer breakneck plot. You know, mm -hmm. they're, they're, you know it is fast, it moves fast, it's, I hope it's funny. But there's also, as with me, there always is stuff going on underneath, which is there if you want it, you know. Mm -hmm. But if you just want a fun read, you know, it's that too. You can read it as deep as you want. Exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, Arun Moon asks, how do you feel about each of your respective works? And is there one that was your particular favourite? Is there one that you struggled with more than others? Is there one that's, a lot of questions here, but it kind of, is there one that you feel differently looking back? Well, the, you know, the, the short answer, and I'm not going to give the short answer because I'm constitutionally incapable of it, but the, the short <laughs> answer is that your books are like your children, and it's hard to say I, you know, I love this one more than the others. But like your children, of course, they're different. They're absolutely different, and they all mean different things to me. Unfortunately, some of them are so far back in the past now that they they almost feel like somebody else's books. So, well, my you know my first book, Tell Chaser Song, was was so far back that it often feels like it was written by another person, and um, I, I finally had to reread it for something about ten or fifteen years ago, and I was very pleasantly surprised to find that I I, I was not horrified by it. You know that it actually worked pretty well because it was actually published without editing due to the kind of the, the, the timing of my my publisher who the, who bought the book Donald Walheim um, was ill and passed the the business on to his daughter Betsy Walheim at the time that right after this had been bought and Don was not big on heavy editing of the stuff that he liked if he thought it was good that was fine and it was already in production schedule so the book that you see is basically what I wrote on my kitchen table with a small amount of proofreading for, for spelling errors or whatever. And then the Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn books, starting with the Dragon Bone Chair, that came next were kind of my spreading my wings, and uh, it was my, my first really big ambitious thing. And it was also, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, it was kind of something where I was really saying, you know, hey, science fiction field. I'm trying to do something serious here, which of course nobody noticed, which made me feel like an idiot. Uh, but it's also what most people knew me for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and still do, actually, a lot of people. Um, still most know me for those books. And then I wrote a couple of short things along the way. I did a collaboration with Nina Kariki Hoffman um, called Child of an Ancient City. And that was fun because of doing the collaboration with Nina, but we were really expanding a, a, a short story of mine. Mm -hmm. So I didn't really do that much more work. I just talked with her and, and, and you know, uh, uh, went back and forth with her as she was adding material to it. Mm -hmm. And I also did a short novel somewhere in there, somewhere called Caliban's Hour, which is a, both a prequel and sequel to The Tempest, Shakespeare's The Tempest, which is my favorite play of his. And that was also very dear to my heart in a number of ways, but it's, it, most people don't know it. And then I did the Otherland books. And in some ways, I, I won't say they're my favorites. Uh, my favorite is always what I'm working on, but I think the Otherland books are the things that are most unique that I've done. Yeah. And the thing that if I had to say, you know, that you know, it gives the best example of all the different things that I do, it's those, because there's all the kind of fantastic adventure epic type side of it. There's a lot of social commentary. There's a lot of, of uh, you know, the social prediction stuff we were talking about. And also I think my sense of humor comes through in that. And so the other land book is kind of the, the package that I would say I'm most was most kind of the full Tad Williams package. But they're very long, you know, and um, only people who really want a big long journey are going to, you know, engage with any of these epics. And then the, the, the Shadow March books, um, as mentioned, started as an, uh, uh, an online serial. And so at the same time I was writing the first volume of Shadow March online, I wrote War of the Flowers, which is um, a standalone 
fantasy about this uh, guy who's actually a little bit like me, except not as lucky, kind of, you know, not having a very good life, yeah. who gets uh, pulled through into the middle of a dynastic war in Fairyland. But Fairyland is very urban. This is, this is you know, modern Fairyland with discos and limousines and skyscrapers and all this stuff, but it's still very much Fairyland. So it was another great world building thing. I really enjoyed that book. I had somebody come up to me at uh, Supernova and say, this is my favorite book. How come hardly anybody knows this? And I said, well, it's one of my favorites too. So I don't know. But uh, I, I did enjoy it very much. It was, and, and it's also a book that before the Bobby Dollar books, it's what I used to give to people and say, you know, this is a good place to start with me since you could actually finish it in one fairly thick volume. And then I started the, um, the you know, Shadow Marsh books, and, and there was four of those by the time I finished the story. And the interesting thing was is that I had to really change gears because I had been writing the first volume online on a schedule. It was a serial. So it was every two weeks I had to have a new chapter online. And remember, I was writing another book also. Mm -hmm. So it was like the equivalent of having to have a chapter online every five or six days because I had, you know, I'd spend one week doing Shadow March and another week doing the other book. And uh, I didn't have a lot of time to plan, to do my normal, like, you know, black box thinking of putting all that stuff in. And I just had to kind of pick what seemed like the best way. So when I finished the first volume, uh, also because Shadow March had had a history earlier, it was, it was almost a, a TV project. And uh, so because it was, when it was initially in its early stages as a TV possibility, I deliberately constructed it like Star Trek or something so that most of the action took place in one place, in this case a castle. And there was a reason why everybody would be coming or going through this castle so that you would, without having to go out and shoot a bunch of expensive locations, why you would get the feeling of how complex this world was. Mm -hmm. You know, like Star Trek, they had like, you know, yeah. a, a couple of backlot sets and they had the Enterprise and then a lot of people in costume. But anyway, so that carried over into the first online volume of Shadow March. So when I realized that I wanted to finish the story, but I was going to finish it in book form, all of a sudden I was like, hey, it's really time to divorce all that one location thing. So uncoincidentally, the first book all takes place, or not all, but I mean most of it takes place in the castle, mm -hmm. or the first volume did. But then I actually added some more plot lines in other parts of the, the, the land this happens in when I turned it into a book because all of a sudden, you know, I could, I had time to think about it, I wasn't just yeah. trying to get a chapter up every week. And so then I finished the Shadow March series, which for me really developed momentum as it went. I feel like, I think all of the books are good because I, I, I'm proud of what I do, but I think it's a story that it, it gets more complex and more interesting as it goes. Yes. Um, and, and part of that was because I had to rethink it on the fly. So I was literally trying to reimagine, because I hadn't really thought the story through in any large sense when I was writing the first volume, because I was doing it online. Okay. So in the second book, as I'm working on the second book, I'm going, what is this book, what is this story really about? If this is one big story, what is this really about? Um, and I realized that it was another one, as many of my books are, they're, they're you know, the Dragon Bone Chair books are about growing up. They're about leaving home, and coming back, and home is different, but so are you, and you know that whole process. And Otherland is about the immortality, about immortality, and which is literally about being having children, what the next generation, living in the river of time. You know that we are, may not be around to see the results of the things we do, but we do them anyway. That was the Otherland books. Yeah. I realized in the middle of the Shadow March books that these are about family. These are about that most compact unit of, of human society and, and how we live with what happens to us and what it makes of us and all of that stuff. So I, didn't, I, I wasn't certain what the theme was until I was into the process, but then once I figured that out, not that I then deliberately, as I said, I don't try to tell, send, I have no messages to send. I mean, a family, there's no message about family. If they're good, they're good, you know? If they're not, it's miserable. But mm. there was no message, there was no hidden code. It's just that once I realized that was what it was about, I could kind of nurture those themes quietly and, and, and I'd say, yeah, this fits in well with what the general tenor is. And then after I finished the last Shadow March books, as I mentioned, I was looking for something to do, and Bobby Dollar. So all of them have different values to me, and I'm proud of things, and, but 
to, to me, they're kind of so much a part of me that it's easier for me to say what favorite characters I have or favorite scenes or settings that I'm particularly proud of. Mm. The books are my working life, you know, and mm. they're almost too big for me to break down as, you know, favorites or whatever. And they're all different. They're all things that happened to me when I was that person mm. as well. I mean, that's why Tell Chaser Song seems so much like it was written by another person, because in one sense, it, obviously it was. It was written by, you know, a 25, 24-year-old guy, you know, and we're all these years later now, and I've got teenagers, uh, you know, uh, which is a kind of an infestation, but it's a lovely one, <laughs> you know, and I live, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm married to a different person, and I've lived in England since then, and you know, I've had this whole career thing, and yeah. you know, it's completely, I'm just not that person. I recognize that person, I remember him. I, I'm fortunately, I'm not too ashamed of him, but I'm not him anymore, and it's hard to remember where I was, and I'm so pleased at least to have this thing that came out of that time of my life, you know. So they're that to me as well, they're, they're tokens. Keepsakes. Keepsakes, yeah. absolutely. The landmarks too. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's, that's an amazing way of looking at it. I've got a really long question here. Nizelson asks, or says, one of the things that I love about Tad's work is that his characters can be almost annoyingly human. Rennie loses patience with everyone all the time. Theo whines. Simon makes rookie mistakes again and again. Barrack is a jerk with a chip on his shoulder. And Bobby Dollar is a cynical dick who drinks too much. <laughs> well, I'm not quite sure... Uh, the interpretation of Dick, but there you go. No, 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 no. Even the extremely cool-headed Binnabit is a bit racist. With all these very human foibles in mind, who do you regard as your most complete, fully fleshed, believable and relatable character and why? Which character is most like Tad Williams? And which character would you most like to go on a camping holiday with? Um, well, I think that the, the, the character I'd most like to go on a camping holiday with would probably be Bobby, but that's because he is probably the most like me in terms of his way of looking at the world. You know, he's, he's, he's very much, uh, he's a cynic, but he's, he's only a cynic because he's a romantic, and romantics, romantics are often cynical because they don't want to get hurt. You know, that's, they've been hurt, they, they, they don't like it, um, and they try to hold the world at bay. But deep down inside, they really want everybody to love them and everything to be the way it should be. And uh, so he's by far the most like me. There's, you know, everybody who's read the books has said, you know, I can really hear you when I'm reading this character's voice. And I'm like, really? I'm trying to make him much cooler than me. And they're going, no, we can hear you. And I go, well, damn. <laughs> there goes the coolness factor. But um, there, several of my characters have a lot of me in them. Uh, Rini from the other land, as mentioned, definitely has both me and my wife Deborah. Um, uh, but but her her kind of obsession with having to do the right thing and take care of people, that's totally me. Another version of that is Joshua in the Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn books, the prince, who is as his his companions keep telling him is absolutely imprisoned by his his feeling of, you know, I don't want to be the cause of other people's suffering, you know, and he has trouble sometimes making decisions because he's so good at envisioning the things that could go wrong and he feels this great sense of personal responsibility, mm -hmm. sometimes exaggerated, which I'm sure is true with me. I'm sure I always feel like what I decide is going to be far more important in terms of its outcome than it really actually is. So he's very much me. Theo from um, the uh, War of the Flowers absolutely is another version of me. And in fact, before Bobby Dollar, he was my, my, the closest thing to an autobiographical character. And his name is even a bit of a tip on that because Theo is usually short for Theodore. And a lot of times people think Tad might be short for Theodore or mm -hmm. something like that. In fact, it's not. It's, it's just a nickname from when I was very small and I've never really had any other name. But I do have a different legal name, which is Robert, which has nothing to do with it. Um, and his last name is Vilmos, which is Hungarian for William. So there's a, you know, he's basically Ted William is really what he is. Um, and he, like me, he, you know, lead singer in a band and, you know, all of that kind of, you know, feelings of complication and insufficiency and all that. But he's a me who has not had the good luck that I had. Mm. He is a me that did not have the loving, healthy family unit that I came out of. My parents were great parents. 
you know, I, I, I had two younger brothers who I loved dearly, who were great people. I had gra loving grandparents. I mean, I, you know, I had a really nice start in the world, and I still do. I'm so lucky. My parents are still around and thriving, and um, so, you know, he's me without the breaks. And he is, you know, he does whine, he does complain, he's been a bit crippled by that. But that's part of what the book is about, mm. is, is him moving past that into the next stage of life, realizing it doesn't matter what hand you're dealt. You, all you can do is work with what you've got. You know, and everybody's got something to complain about. Some people have real things to complain about. Uh, lots of my characters have bits of me in them, but one thing I don't do is I don't tend to base characters on real people. I, I will, obviously, bits of me get into everything, even the bad guys, and uh, which is a little disturbing sometimes, but that's how I find my way in. I find similarities. Not, you know, like, I, I for instance, in the Otherland books, there's a character named Dread who is particularly unpleasant, coincidentally Australian, but particularly unpleasant guy, uh, a serial killer. And, um, you know, when I'm going to write somebody like that, I have to find a connection. Now, you know, this is a guy who's like the exact opposite of me, had, had this horrible upbringing, he's a, a hater of women, he is a, a murderer, you know, he's a sociopath. So, you know, I, I hope it's not that easy for me to find my way into that, but I, I do try to do it. So what I look is, I say somebody like him, you know, he's a, it, it expresses itself for me in being kind of a control freak. Now, I'm not a control freak in terms of people's behavior. I'm a control freak in worrying about other people's happiness. That's my control freakery. But also with my own creative process. I'm very jealous of my creative process and I, I feel like I really am careful and thoughtful about things and I'm not going to easily let people talk me into things. Do you ever find that you have fun with the villain? Oh god yeah. yeah. Absolutely. No because, and in particular with somebody like me, because I am not a mean person and I would never be a mean person. Um, I have a horror. I hate bullies. That's like one of my biggest things. I just loathe bullies. Well, at some some air, some level, I'm probably you know I probably have an obs you know kind of a little obsession about it. So what I try to do is I try to find where those obsessions come from, and then say, okay, take that feeling and imagine a situation in which it turns dark. You know, imagine that like this character that you were raised by a brutal. Uh, not just unhappy, but like psychotic mother. His mother is a, um, he's, ha he's half Aboriginal, half uh, uh, white. His, his mother was a prostitute up in the, the, in the Northern Territories, and he's, you know, she treated him horribly. She, you know, she abused him, she hurt him, all this stuff. And that's where this comes out of, in part, with him. I mean, it's never that simple. But um, So I, I will take that thing in me that, that feels like, Everything is safer if I'm the one in charge, you know. And I will turn that out into, you know, say, now if I disliked other people, and if I especially disliked women, how would that express itself, you know? And you find your way into it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's elements of me in all, char in, in all my characters, because that's how I find my way in. But the other thing, too, is also, and this is true of, I think, writing in general, I have to write something that I would want to read. And I'm not interested in characters that are not quirky. I am not interested in a character who you know is going to do the right thing. I am much more, I mean, you know, because they're so successful and, and competent, I am much more interested in what would somebody like me, who means well, but may not be fully qualified for this stuff, you know, whatever it might be, whether it's slaying dragons or, you know, and you throw them into that situation. I can identify with that. You know, I can't identify with Superman. I can identify with Batman, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's that kind of a thing. It doesn't mean I'm not interested in Superman, yeah. but it means I'm more interested in, in reading about the average person who has, you know, been thrust into these situations and tries to do something. Similarly, and this is crucial, and I don't think people often always realize it, I think you have to have a sense of humor if you're going to make good characters. That doesn't mean they have to be funny, although it's perfectly nice if some of them are, but it means you have to understand about the timing and the quirks of social interaction. When you're writing dialogue, people are not passing information back and forth and that's all they're doing. When people are talking, there are a zillion other things going on. Yeah. There are all kinds of agendas, there are social panic and, and misapprehension about things and it's a very complex process. Yeah. And you know, if you have a sense of humor, you tend to be somebody who, 
who is an observer of that stuff and you understand what pauses mean and you understand what the tiniest movement of the face signifies and you know you know why certain words have a big impact you know and others don't and they're more neutral so you know all of that stuff I think you know comes out of putting yourself into the situation mm. you know and I think that's really crucial but the, my favorite characters are usually come down to, to three kinds one of them is obviously the main characters because I live with them for so long and if I'm gonna live with them for so long I have to find a way to feel that I know them and once I know them then I care about them mm -hmm. just as I hope the readers do and so watching their journey even though I'm the one causing the things to happen becomes a process of, of being involved with somebody as if you knew them personally mm -hmm. but then my other two favorite kinds of characters are um, villains mm -hmm. because I'm not that person myself mm -hmm. uh, and and there's a certain freedom to just having somebody who just you know uh, sort of says, um, actually, no, I'm not interested, and then shoots the guy. You know, I mean, there's, I'm so not that guy. But, but there's a, a, you know, there's a lure, you know, right. and there's something about that that is just really exciting, you know, somebody who has no qualms and has no social guilt and, you know. And plus, good, scary characters are memorable. You know, mm -hmm. people tell me, oh, God, I still think about Dread. He's still like my, my, my scariest character ever in fiction. You know, I'm like really pleased by that. Or, you know, <laughs> what? it's like, oh, and like in the beginning of the Memory Star and Thorn books, and that guy deliberately steps on the puppy. How could you do that? I'm going, so you would feel just like that, right? And so for the rest of the book, every time that guy walks in, you would know this man is not just dangerous, he is crazy dangerous, you know? Would I step on a puppy? Hell no! Is it a real puppy being stepped on? No, it's a puppy in a book. Remember, it's an imaginary puppy. No actual puppies were damaged in the making of this fiction. You know, I, you need I, that flag on the book. <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't do that myself. I'm an animal lover. I have four dogs. You know, I love, love animals and people. But, you know, you're not reading my books just because you want to read about all nice things and fun things. You want adventure. You want to be frightened, you know. So I've got to frighten you. Mm -hmm. So I pick things to do that will frighten you because they're so wrong. And to be a writer, I have to explore those places. And if I do it successfully, it's very effective. So I, I love that. Yeah. So when I find a character, and it's really weird because it feels almost like finding them. Because the it's, it's, same thing is true for actors. Sometimes you just work and work with something and then you find it. And it's the same thing with writing characters. Sometimes I work and work and work with them and then I find it. And so like when I found Binnabix's voice in the Memory Song and Thorn books, he's the troll. He has these wise little sayings that are actually quite absurdist, some of them, you know. Um, and, and people now, you know, 20 something years later, people still can quote me Binnabix quotes that they love and stuff like that, you know. And when you find somebody like that, that who makes you laugh or who, you know, makes you go, oh, that's so cool, even though I wrote it, that's cool, you know. Um, I love those. You know, I have a, there's a guy also in the um, memory Sauron Thorn books uh, called Avi Steto, and that's his nickname. And what it means is I have a knife. And every situation that he's, he's just a very minor character. He shows it like three or four times. And, and he, he thinks he's a bad dude, but he's just a, you know, he's just an idiot. Um, and I just had so much fun going like, oh, this would be a good time to have him show up again. And then at the very end, I'm going to have somebody punch him in the face because he's such a jerk. And indeed, I had one of my other amusing characters that I enjoyed writing. Just, you know, this guy tries to threaten him, and, and he's, the guy he's trying to threaten is like four times his size, you know, and a grizzled old veteran of many wars, and he just turns around and just decks him. And I had people writing me letters, that was so cool, you know. <laughs> but I enjoy it too, you know. I can step back from it far enough to go like, yeah, that was satisfying, because that guy was such a dick, you know, and then and he, he gets smacked, and he deserved it badly. So, yeah, those are, my, those are my favorites, and I enjoy those, and whenever I come up with one of those, um, I'm happy. And my only problem, really, is I sometimes try to come up with too many of them, you know, and then you're, you're kind of over-egging the pudding a bit, and I try to tamp that back down again. Mm. You, you're talking about all these really in-depth, epic fantasies, big book. I mean, even Bobby Dollar's big compared to a comic, and yet you've written comics. How have you made that tr transition? Well, I, I'm not doing it at the moment, and, and one of the reasons why is, this, sadly for me, is, is the economics of it, which is I just can't make enough money writing comics to, to make up for not writing books, which make me better money, because I love comics. Yeah. And that's one of those cases where I tried to sort of step in horizontally, and I went to, to you know, I, I, I 
for various way, in ver through various routes, I got connected into DC, even though I was really more of a Marvel Comics kid when I was growing up. But I, I wound up at DC writing Aquaman. And on one level, it was a semi-frustrating experience because they didn't tell me that they had already decided to cancel it unless there was a huge increase in sales. There was not a huge increase in sales, but a lot of people kind of got what I was trying to do and went, oh, this is a really interesting thing. This like feels like Aquaman's getting interesting again. And, um, and I was really, you know, I like building worlds, so I was like all ready to kind of get this whole, you know, the new generation for Aquaman and how things would work for him. And so when I found out near the end of the run that, the, you know, I've kind of been like, well, God, I'm really having trouble getting, you know, the artists I want, or I'm having trouble getting to use these other characters, and I kind of began to realize it's because they don't give a damn about this character. They've already decided that they're going to shut down this book. So that and a number of other things, and as I said, the fact that it wasn't like I was making any money, it was purely a work of love as far as I was concerned, mm -hmm. um, meant that I had to kind of stop doing it. But if I get to a point in the future again where I have the time where I can afford to do it without you know, my children having to go live in a cardboard box under an overpass, then I'd love to do it again. I love comics. It's a wonderful medium. It, and as you said, it's very different. Mm -hmm. And it's like film. For somebody like me especially, you've got to condense, 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 condense. So if nothing else, it's brilliant practice to be put into that mindset of like, you have the equivalent of maybe five or six pages of prose or less to tell an entire story, you know? And yes, you do have the drawings and that helps because obviously that does a, a huge amount of the storytelling if you use them properly, if, you know, and if your artist is good. But it's, it's, it's amazing to get focused that way. Also, what's interesting about it for me personally is normally, being the control freak that I am, I have complete control over the characters because I invented them. And then you're working in a shared universe. It's a completely different experience. And it's, that was a lot of fun for me too. And I'd love to do that again. So that's where I am on comics at the moment. It was a great thing. I'd love to do it again. Um, I don't have anything particular at the moment lined up. So. Is there anything on your bucket list as a writer? I have a serious book that I would like to write in the sense that it's not a genre book. Um, because I lived not only in a very, I, I grew up I should say, not only in a very interesting time, but actually in a very interesting place and in a very interesting milieu. Um, in the, the you know, 60s and 70s in the San Francisco Bay Area in California, a time of immense freedom of of not just uh, action, but of possibility and of self-conception. Um, I was somebody who was playing in rock and roll bands. I was doing theater. Our whole life was about literally creating selves. Um, but we were also beginning to watch as, uh, you know, we were the, the next sort of mini generation on from the 60s kids. The 60s kids were our older siblings and in some cases our parents. Um, so we were kind of watching as you know, we were we were in between. We were we were you know we were definitely very much of the feeling that like the old days are dead. Everything's possible. You know, if you were a girl, you felt you know, and if you were in my social circle, that you know you, you could do anything. You should be able to do anything you wanted to. That if you were uh, somebody like me, that if you wanted to make a creative career, you could. Um, but at the same time, we were also kind of. We thought that the, the hippie thing was a bit, you know, like too utopian and wasn't very realistic and was also sometimes just boring. And besides, who wants to live on a commune and be dirty and eat wheatgrass all day? And, you know, I mean, so we were kind of in between those two things. And it was a really wild time to grow up. And, and not only that, in my case, we actually had wild adventures, my friends and I. We really did. We were very active young people and we were boys and girls who went out and made things happen and we were theatrical and we were artistic and we did crazy stuff and we also did things that in retrospect were you know not very sensible um, and and kind of experienced the most life could have to, could have pre-AIDS and pre-anti-drug backlash and all that stuff mm. and I, it was also very interesting particularly the, the area that I grew up because it had been one of the hubs of the 60s. Yeah. Everybody knows about Berkeley, everybody knows about San Francisco, not as many people realize that Palo Alto where I grew up was the third leg of that tripod mm -hmm. in, in California, especially in Northern California. You know, Ken Kesey, 
uh, wrote the One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest while I was working at the VA hospital there. Um, you know, one of my friend's older brothers was on the Merry Pranksters bus. The Grateful Dead and Joan Baez went to my high school. Grace Slick lived next to one of my friends. So Palo Alto was a very big hub because of Stanford University for the 60s. Berkeley was more famous for it, but we were culturally just as involved in it, you know. So it was an amazing place to land, and I, I really want to write a, a, a good novel about not just the things that happened, but what it felt like, mm -hmm. which would be a little more experimental than some of my other fiction. It would bring in a little more of my sort of Thomas Pynchon side, because I've always been a big Thomas Pynchon fan. Not literally I want to write a Thomas Pynchon novel, but I mean in that sense of being able to kind of really just play with language and ideas and, and you know stuff like that. So yeah, that's on my bucket list. I definitely am going to do that at some point. My wife says, oh God, please, no, don't try to write a serious novel. We'll starve. <laughs> um, but as a human being, I mean, yeah, there's a zillion places I'd like to travel, but you know, I'll be honest, Nalini, I have been, uh, you know, this is like one of those things where the people burst into sentimental tears, which don't worry, I'm not going to do. But I have been so lucky, you know, I've had this wonderful career doing stuff I love. Mm -hmm. I have a great family, both the one I was born into and the one my wife and I have created for ourselves. I'm surrounded by cool people. I have so many, I have way more friends than I know what to do with, you know, in the sense I can never spend as much time with everybody as I want to. Mm -hmm. I play music with the guys I, I first was in a band with back in, in junior high school and we still play together and they're amazing musicians and hilarious guys and you know I, I have all these things I want to do that I don't have time to do like you know I don't get to do art anymore I miss painting and, and things like that but and you're theater, a real and, renaissance and theater man. well yeah a renaissance man with no re renaissance <laughs> I am. but you know and theater and all this stuff that I love and I'd love to do more of but you know I have just had such a full plate of wonderful experiences that I, I, I do, I tell my family this, it sounds maudlin, but it's not meant to be. I say, you know, guys, if something happens to me and I get run over by a bus or something, you know, you know I'm sure you'll miss me, and of course, I, you know, that would be the only thing I'd regret is that I wouldn't get to spend, you know, many, many more years with you guys, but don't ever feel like I was cheated, you know, I had a, just a grand life, mm -hmm. and I really have, so, so the bucket list is all you know, at this point, anything that I get to do like that is just going to be pure gravy because it's all been really good. Fabulous. Is there anything you'd like to say to fans? Um, just keep being wonderful. Keep reading. You know, um, books are, you know, we're, we're at an, a point where, you know, people worry about what's the future of books, what's the future of reading, and I'm not worried about that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I know that there's something in, in books, in literature, it's a fundamentally interactive art form that in the way nothing else is. There's nothing else because there is no other art form with possible exception of music, but that's almost like a different part of the brain. There's no other art form where the, the perceptor, the, the receiver of the stuff is doing as much work as the person creating the stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, and I rely on that. That's my books are brilliant if my readers are brilliant, you know, and and most of them are, fortunately, and they make me much better than I really am because they, they, they cast the movies, they make the scenery. Mm -hmm. So reading will never go away. Um, but I still love it that people read. I think that readers are the most fun people to talk to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I always, I am one. I still, every time I go into a bookstore or a library, I'm a happy guy. Um, I feel like, I feel so sorry for people who don't read because I feel like when that time does come and you know if I have the luxury of being able to think about it as I'm breathing my last few breaths um, that I will feel like I lived thousands of lives because of reading mm -hmm. you know that I've experienced a zillion things I never had time for uh, and I sometimes feel like God if all you have to take with you is um, Disneyland and the Transformer movies as your other life experiences then you're missing a lot. I feel like mm. I, you know, lived through the French Revolution with Sidney Carton, and I feel like I've just done a zillion different things. That, uh, you know, been to uh, been to the Tropic Isle with uh, with Prospero, and you know, all these many, many, many wonderful experiences I've had to put up with Mrs. Bennett, with uh, Jane Austen. Uh, <laughs> you know, so what a marvel! I mean, what a sad thing to not have that in your life. And I'm really lucky I had you know, parents who were readers and, and I was introduced to it and 
my biggest thrill as a writer actually is when somebody says something about my books and I realize, wow, I filled that space in somebody else's life or a space in somebody else's life in the same way that my favorite writers did for me. I just think that's the highest calling and the highest gift I could get. Well, thank you very much for talking to Doug Meadow. Extremely welcome. Thank you for talking to me.